And in this panel, we also have a lot of opportunity for you to ask. So we have two stations here to ask. And ask about what you like to do. We reserve some time for Q&A in this panel. So I'd like to call on station on the panelists of the marketing panel. I will introduce all of them to you. And we then get into the discussion. Um, so first, David Kenny. Um, then we have Andrew Robertson, who is just speaking to our board member, Philip Welte. We have Samia Aroa of uh, Plan Media. And we have Trevor Nelson of um, Jared, excuse me, of Nike, absolutely powerhouse. Pleasure having you here. And we have Anne Sundjensen of Mercedes Benz. Um, so, gentlemen. Hello. I should have the um, <laughs> sign. So is everybody seated? Exactly, Lisa. Lisa, I have to ask you with my ignorance at some point how I pronounce your name in the best way. Lisa Manzur de Cavallo Juanes Gomez, the chairman of and I introduce everybody to you later. Um, again to present you on, on, on the right side of you, um, there is Trevor Edwards. The Redwoods is the uh, Vice President Global Brand and Category Management of Nike. Nike is a $19 billion powerhouse of brands, and he is said to be one of the most innovative brand builders and marketeers um, in his business. We have been also um, awarded for that in the drive. I think 75% of Nike's business and categories through your stewardship. Very happy to have you here. Um, Left to him is uh, David Kenny, who is the managing partner at Viva Key, um, the newly created interactive arm of Publicis Group, um, global, one of the top three global advertising and marketing uh, groups. And you said you bring together basically different arms of digital marketing and build a competence center out there. And David is representing that in his steering strategy there. And he's also a uh, chairman of the Global Agenda Council of Marketing, of marketing of the West, basically. Thinks a lot beyond the market. Then we have Samia Arola, who is a zero entrepreneur, ex Apple, <coughs> and recently, five years ago, launched Plan Media. Disclosure, it's a border related company. And uh, I think you have a thesis that brand marketing online works. I will mention what the others tell you. And uh, so, so that is something you might discuss. You're a little bit the challenge of brand online at this point, because you know the saying of lousy pennies on the other side. I'm very happy that we have back to DLD after four years, my friends and friends, um, and Robertson, of the chairman of BBDO, a truly iconic company in advertising, um, and which won most, I think, awards in the industry at all. Um, and four years ago, when uh, Robert uh, Andrew spoke here, you he really uh, made a deal with Morgan Jenkins. And I'm happy that you're back. And he's seated um, next to Anders Jutsun Jensen, who is um, the Vice President of Brand Communication at Mercedes Benz. Um, and he's basically developing and stewarding the brand image of, of Mercedes globally, um, another iconic brand of elegance and innovation, I may say so. Um, but also, everybody has his challenges in this, in this market, and how do you, how do you um, address that? And I'm also very, very happy that Nazim Manzura de Cavallo Juanes Gomez, was that right, is here, who is the chairman of ABC uh, Group and of Africa, and um, Nizan comes from Brazil, and Brazil is one of these superpowers I know too little about, actually. And it's one of these global economies we know not so much, but which is a huge, very innovative market, especially for those people marketing, also mar uh, a market where marketing and brands really have a, have a, a lot of creativity, but also a lot of um, a huge kind of scale in terms of mobile business and others. So I'm happy that you're here. And this is really kind of a, a wonderful balance. I'd like to introduce now to you two minutes a clip. Um, 
and to, to initiate this panel, this um, five, six man, and going back to 1960. And could I have that now? Could I have tone, please? The colors hurt us. And that's the sequence of Mad Men. Who knows Mad Men? Series? Mad is, you, you should all know Mad Men, basically. So, Mad is, Mad is Mad is a four or five times Emmy Award winning um, show, series, um, I think it's the third season in the States, about advertising in the 60s. And I would like to show just uh, a minute and a half what how how that advertising was created with uh, a, a, a nice moment um, to start with, and the setting is that uh, Don Draper, the head of uh, Mad Men, is pitching uh, to a client, and, and that's uh, basically how he tries to persuade. That was your lipstick, Mark Ewan. I only see one lipstick in your drawing. Women want colors, lots and lots of colors. Mark your man. It's pretty cute. Oh, you like this? Well, maybe we should cut down to five shades or one. I'm not telling you to listen to anyone, but this is a very fresh approach. It's a bit too. I don't think there's much else to do here. Call my dad. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Is that all? You're a non-believer. Why should we waste time on Kabuki? I don't know what that means. It means that you've already tried your plan, and you're number four. You've enlisted my expertise, and you've rejected it to go on the way you've been going. I'm not interested in that. You can understand. I don't think your three months or however many thousands of dollars entitles you to refocus the core of our business. Listen, I'm not here to tell you about Jesus. You already know about Jesus. Either he lives in your heart, or he doesn't. Every woman wants choices. But in the end, none wants to be one of a hundred in a box. She's unique. She makes the choices, and she's chosen him. She wants to tell the world he's in mine. He belongs to me, not you. She marks her man with her lips. He is her possession. You've given every girl that wears your lipstick the gift of total ownership.
to really think more about buying and helping people to ex experience life, to experience their life and experience products in a much better way. So that really sort of sets the foundation for the shift. One of the second things that we think a lot about, particularly I think everyone's here, is about information and certainly how the consumer is becoming more and more comfortable with actually allowing us the privilege of their information. And when we have that information, if you use that information properly, you can actually better service them. And I think that's one of the biggest shifts that we're going through. Right now is when an adolescent faith, I think we said this morning, where we're using a lot of the information more so to sort of support an old model that's almost passed and is passing by, which is still about advertising, as opposed to it's about actually helping serve people's lives with their products. That's the second, the second biggest part. And the third one I would kind of really pull out, uh, pull out is specifically what we are seeing is a focus on that not just connecting with one individual consumer, um, that's absolutely important and sets the foundation for the things that we're doing, but what we are sort of seeing is that one consumer has tremendous influence because of they are always connecting with other consumers. And so what we see, the consumers in charge, they are radically shifting. We have more and more information about them. If we use that information better, we can actually serve them better. At the end of the day, they are, the, they are as I would always say, you know, they are our judge and jury, and ultimately our executioner, if we don't deliver uh, to them uh, what they're looking for. Trevor, thank you. Let me ask you specifically, what does, it, what does this mean, or did this mean to you, for your business decisions? This year, last year, or next year? No, I mean, I, I think that, you know, this is, this being specific in terms of how our organization has to evolve. Um, certainly, a lot of the tools and things that we see that are being created, a lot of the techniques that we talk about are great tools. Um, we obviously are using information much more, and we'll, I'll show some examples, we'll talk about some examples maybe later on, like our Nike Plus as an example. Where we are able, we are able to take the running data from a consumer and actually give it back to them in some really fresh and interesting ways. That's a, that's a matter of taking information or an ID, ID, which is a customization model in terms of giving the consumer a more personal product. So any one of these are pretty quantum shifts in the marketplace, and they're allowing us to be more connected. But it ultimately is focused on serving that consumer better so that they can get on their journey to have a better life, better experience, be better athletes in, in, in our business. So that's kind of how I'll touch it back to Thanks. David, you know, just doing the rounds, how, how, how do you see that? Yeah, I well, agree with all of that. I, I think the challenge I'm most focused on is a constant pace of innovation. Uh, because I, I don't think you can just communicate your way out of innovative products. And I, I think what we're finding now with the speed of communication is how quickly you have to innovate. And there is nothing you can take for granted. Uh, so not one of our clients, but a good story. I come from a small state in America called Massachusetts. Um, there is a, Barack Obama won that state by the widest margin of any state. And um, there was a, um, sadly, a, a senator passed away, Ted Kennedy. And the assumption was, well, it's always been a Democrat. In fact, it's always been a Kennedy for 47 years. From the time of Mad Men, the next one will be as well. There was a good contest to nominate the nominee, but then she thought because she was the Democratic nominee, she won. She went on vacation. Another guy, very slowly, through social networks, built the man under the radar. Didn't really take a television ad out until 10 days before the campaign. And he won by a pretty wide margin. So, no annuity counted, right? No annuity be counted. We see this all the time with products. Brands think they built this brand equity over five, six decades. It will prevail. The line extension will work. It really isn't. The truth comes out as to whether there's a real innovative product or not. And a lot of what we're spending time on is actually making sure the product innovation is there. Because otherwise, the communication is irrelevant. So, you would think that the fundament of brands is not that stable anymore. This point, you, you tell us what you tell the clients. I, I don't think so at all. I think that uh, I think the, the idea of brand asset value is less relevant today than it's ever been. The truth of a product, the truth of whether the product is genuinely better than the other, will be known by people. They will tell each other the best products win. Um, and I think we all have a much higher obligation and responsibility.
a requirement to be involved with the product, not just the communication. So the product quality is informing about product qualities or what it is? Yes, and whether people really like it and what their experience is. Quality is in the eyes of the user. That's right, so it's, uh, yeah, it's essential. Okay. Uh, Samir. I, I think that's a really good question on, you know, what's the biggest thing from a brand perspective? And I think I'd like to just go back in time when I was at Apple and in part building and really trying to understand how to build a, a brand that was very young. And what comes to my mind is the, the, the example that's used a lot in almost all schools and, and marketing circles is about the Coke and Pepsi campaign and how, you know, in, in most cases when they did testing, Pepsi with the young generation would win and they pick it by campaign on that premise. What was fascinating to me is if you look at the study, that if they did the same tests without a brown bag, Coke always won. So to me, that's what branding is about, which is just the real essence of the creation of design. Um, now, in our current world we live in, unlike this revolution of television and cable we've seen, um, you've got to look at two other factors. So the product itself, the brand, now you have to look at what our consumers do, which is what we talked about a little bit earlier, and then the third is, what is the medium or the media business that will allow you to interact with them? Uh, the biggest changes that have happened, in my opinion, are in buckets two and three, not as much in one. And I think that's what I find troubling is when, when we started with, at Glam, one of our first premise was brands need to engage customers very early on in setting the attributes of how they want to be perceived. Uh, while the internet as a medium until then was largely being used for direct response, which comes very, very late. But someone <laughs> said, you know, if you're trying to buy a you know, car and try to find a, a dealer by zip code, uh, it's very late to change you to, you know, from a Mercedes to a Volvo. You, you're very deep in that decision process. So, in terms of me, the biggest challenge is to really understand the changes in consumer behavior with the internet. Or as I say, what is the consumer doing on the web? Not what you think they're doing, not what you'd like them to do, not what you're used to them doing, but really what are they doing? So, you know, to me, the amount of change that has happened, especially in the last, I would say, 12 years, there are some fundamental changes in consumer behavior. I'll name two, which affects brands a lot. One is, we are now a search researcher. We, we don't go into a newsstand and say, I don't want the magazines, I just want the articles on yoga retreats or sailing in you know, cigars. We take the packaged media as a whole and consume it. On the internet, we don't do that. We go, we search, we find things with total disregard for media as brands. So the media brand has become very, very uh, fragmented. That's the first change. On the actual consumer side also, from only being involved in the tail end of the consumption, you're now involved in social media, you're involved as an influencer, and the cycle is both ways. So uh, I think that as a publisher, what really concerning for us is not to attach ourselves with the older definitions of media, which was to create content in a one-way direction through distribution of either magazines or television but still involved in the true definition of media, which is to find consumers in places where they, are, where they want advertising and they're receptive to advertising, and the internet is a fantastic medium. If you look at the time being spent, um, actually on the engagement metrics, not just reach, a lot of people talk about reach, but if you look at any of the top agencies that report like us go on, not just reach, but usage, the usage is absolutely staggering. So the consumer has already left. Now the question is, as a brand, how can we help brands better recapture some of that emotion that we're used to getting largely from television and a lot from okay. I mean, Thank you. Coming back later in the segment on this, okay, if that is all true, I would like to know why there's a little marketing and advertising spend in this medium right now. But the photo is referring to the lousy pennies. Television is still not there. I would like to know that later. That's, that's very interesting, but we should discuss them. I'd like to know from Europe then why and when at some point and why not. But um, just, just we, we should dig into this point because it's 
very, very important. Um, um, Andrew, now my initial question to you: What's the big challenge for you right now? Where do you see this key driving change factor at this point? What does it mean to you being such an established group? You know that is that is in this very established business at this point. I mean, <clears throat> I think that. Uh, is that whilst an awful lot is, has changed, yeah. I don't sit in rooms with people smoking much these days. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cold book on their usual but um, What I found interesting is how little hasn't changed, how much hasn't changed. Um, the fundamental requirement that we have is to answer the same questions as Don Draper was asking. Uh, how do consumers behave today and why? What are the motivations for that behavior? And he, as portrayed in that 1961 clip, recognized that the fundamental motivations were emotional, not rational. That hasn't changed. Isolating those, understanding those, is still very, very important. And then, how do we create something, in his case, a couple of pieces of cardboard, that will engage uh, the attention of that consumer and give them an experience that changes their behavior the way we want to change. Those, those questions are exactly the same in 2010 as they were in 1961. Uh, people don't change that much. They really don't. Technology changes unbelievably fast, but people don't. Their fundamental motivations and needs are pretty much the same as they were five years ago, ten years ago, a thousand years ago. Um, and the trick is to, to somehow manage both things. How do you live with the pace of change in technology, the tools that we have to use, whilst keeping your head very, very square on the questions, fundamental questions, that we still need to provide answers to? And those, they just haven't changed. They're the same questions as they were and they always be. And, and I believe the challenge, the biggest signal challenge, is still the same one. How do you create an experience that is sufficiently engaging for an audience to choose to participate in it and which changes their behavior? That's, that's the business. So the tools change, the, the timelines change, the speed changes, all of that changes, but those questions remain the same. So, so basically, you say, okay, but you're not that concerned about what's happening in the in the web. In fact, what Trevor was addressing to that advertising is not still. That you don't need advertising at this point anymore because the consumer is, as also David said, informing himself, herself, um, going specifically to a question. Well, I I, um, I use the same definition of advertising as consumers do, um, as opposed to you know the way it is. Consumers, I'm sure, regard an awful lot of the activities that Trevor's referring to as non advertising as advertising. For me, advertising is any communication, any experience uh, that changes the way consumers behave. So um, I think the form changes, but the principles, and the goals, and the issues don't. Okay. So I would like to ask you the same initial question. Now. What changes? What is the challenge for you? Also now, from a huge global brand perspective. Well, so many clear words from so many wise men, and how to follow up on that. And just to follow up what you just said, Andrew, I think that in a world of turbulent change, it's so nice that some of the major questions remain the same. I can't, you couldn't have said it better than I would have done it, because the major questions we're asking ourselves as marketers today hasn't changed at all. It's how to attract attention, how to say how that we get people out there who have desire, desire for all products. Because at the end of the day, it's about selling products. Of course, there are some very fundamental changes. And that is that we very quickly have to ask the question, which means the best one to say about that we transport our message. Here we have a huge variety of possibilities, and I do believe that we have what we've seen so far during the last years, we all together have been isolated, talking about the future of print, the future of TV, the future of internet, and so on. I think that's a stupid 
discussion because it has nothing to do by discussing one means separately. This has something to do which thing is the best to transport our message. A lot of people involved in the media business, they do not understand this question. And they will be dead in a quite short period of time. It's quite easy. Or they can commit suicide at very short notice, and then we get rid of a lot of problems which we have to face. It's very, very simple for us. We start very early in our process to ask the question, we get a message. We do not ask our agents enough to develop a print campaign or a TV campaign. We ask our agency, and in that case, our creative agencies also have had to learn a lesson. Because at that table, also my media, by an agency, is sitting, and we start discussing where are the information channels, the communication channels, best fitted to transport that, media, that message. And that is the biggest change we have. Beside that, just relax all together. The questions remain the same. Could you give from now steering Mercedes um, an example where you said you shifted the media mix but you, the message was the same with a, a launch you now have or one recent kind of initiative, initiative you launched where you said okay, we changed you know, the media mix or we changed something but we kept the same message we could have had 10, 15 years ago? Message. The message is always how to transport the brand philosophy or product philosophy. That hasn't changed at all. However, of course, the elements we play with was the wording symbols, the symbol symbols, and that changed. That depends on the very much upon the audience you want to approach. And that is, it's, we, we were constantly on the move, but we completely wrong to say that we do not change the way we communicate. We say the questions, that's what I meant about it. The questions we're asking are the same. Of course, you have to develop and be state of the art in what you're doing. You also know that the generation growing up, and by the way, this generation has nothing to do with demographics. A lot of people start talking about age. Age is definitely not a very good demographic element to diversify. If you take uh, Prince Charles and Ossie Osborne, I think that example has been used several times. They're just as old. I think they all together can agree upon that their psycho psychographics look quite different. That means again, when I communicate communication towards Prince Charles, it will be a bit different. And when I communicate with also also for that reason, it's not that easy to answer your question with a very simple answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nisa, now um, maybe I'd like to ask your perspective. Already there are five um, answers to that, but where do you see that? Maybe you take from your market, from your region, Brazil, from your group, you created a perspective on what is the challenge right now for you? Um, where do you see, what should people here in the audience have in mind when they think about marketing? Well, uh, with all due respect to my colleagues and uh, people here who I highly respect, I think that what has changed from that moment today is courage. Courage. Because the advertising agencies, they have a very cost uh, intensive structure. So, it's very difficult for them to speak to somebody. Maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't have spoken in that way, but with that part, you know. By the way, we have two brilliant clients here, but there's a lot of lousy clients. Who can stand General Motors? I was not created by God to serve to General Motors. You know, the guy comes in and he says, I want you to give me all the best work, but I don't want to pay anything. Isn't so that fantastic? That's a great business model. <laughs> so I said, look, get out. No, I'm not going to work with you. And it's not because I'm braver than the others, it's because my structure is leader. So that's why I believe very much in the small business. And that's why I believe so much change is going to come from small structures. And that's why I have I want to have several small digital shops around the world people who can say no. And I know exactly what I, I've been part of the DDB board. I know very well our situation. You know, I respect highly, but it's very, very hard to say no when you have such a hard structure. You have too many mouths to feed. And nothing really great is worth from fear. So the great challenge now is how to be courageous when you have so much structure.
I, I think this needs commentary, so. <laughs> and also from the audience, I see we have a over there, who created this. You would say an independent smaller group out of a bigger one. Maybe you could comment later on that stage. Okay, but Trevor knows. Yeah, I, I, maybe I want to comment, you know, not so much on the courage part, but I do think that this, this assumption that things haven't changed, I, I believe is a fallacy. I think it's really important to say that things have changed. We started out with a model that was really about mass communications. Now the consumer can actually interact with us. And they're actually giving us information. They're telling us what they want. They're giving us clues. Our job is to listen to those clues more acutely, more, more deliberately than we've ever done before. And in that provides a new opportunity for us to succeed and create great products create great services, and ultimately give them great experiences. But it comes from looking at the perspective, looking at a different perspective. We were looking at it from manufacturers, advertisers, outward, as opposed to consumers who are living their lives, doing things every single day, inward. I feel that if, you, if we can make that shift, particularly around the digital model, it allows us to far more bigger opportunities. That's why I keep saying I, I believe we should embrace it as a change, even though the fundamental questions remain, we can embrace it as a change and we find new opportunities. I think that's certainly the way that we keep coming back at it, which is embrace it as a change, we'll see bigger opportunities for us to serve those consumers. And I, I think you're 100% right, but I, but I think what tends to happen is that the change becomes the end in itself. And I think all I'm saying is recognize you have to live with both. You have the same sticky, tough, horribly hard questions to answer. You have a lot of very exciting new things to execute against the results as well. And what I observe is that the revolutionaries like to forget about the questions and just talk about what wonderful things are possible. And then there's another group of people who only are really interested in what hasn't changed, the trick is the end, not the all. Um, and I believe that that's, you know, that is the way you can make hay while the sun is shining, because, uh, because most people won't do that. David, would you like to comment also on yeah, uh, so Because you're representing a big structure, I don't know what your cost structure is, but um, I'd like to comment on that. I would. Um, and this I started my agency, and uh, when it was small, saying no is good, saying what if is better, and we, we did great things. And I hear a lot of entrepreneurs who have that visceral reaction, but you all want to get bigger. You all want to be big, right? And so did we, and we did get bigger. And then we had public shareholders that got bigger again, and we emerged with food business. Now we brought in Razorfish, which has the same DNA, and several others. My, my dream in life is to have both big and small, because we're actually more courageous as big. Because when you're big, you can try to get something done at Yahoo or Google or Microsoft, and they, they can invest in you in a way that they can't invest if you're smaller because it's complex. So I, I think the challenge for the agency, but the challenge for the market, <laughs> is to be big and small at the same time because there's a lot of power in big. I think the real, to, to me, the difference between big and small has a lot to do with ego. People at the top have to accept that they are not the smartest people in the company. If you take your ideas from within, you have a lot of stars. And I think at the very basic level, this is what consumers are telling us. The consumers want to be the star. Maybe they know more about what they love than you do. Maybe they have a fashion sense better than ours. The fact that we live in Paris doesn't give us the right to determine what is fashion. Although some do think that. It's this whole notion of empowerment in the company and all the way to the consumers of what we can do with this technology, we can be big and small. And I think it will be better when we pull that off. And, and they would, I mean, you, you acquired Razorfish, um, and, and Razorfish was an interactive agency, which was basically, put it simply, build websites and build interactive environments. And then, and then you draw on this digital side to business. We shift over to the digital side there, but I would like to ask Arno this big and small um, question that was uh, raised. So for you as a client, how do you look at that? You know, do you um, at that question? You know, you, we had Musa was saying, okay, things are different. But what is your stance? What I, what I really 
screen and it's we have completely changed the rules for you. That is something I think that no one needs to accept. You can always look upon that as a big risk, you can look upon it as a challenge, and for me it's a challenge with an emotional opportunity. I think that's one of the most important things. I fully agree with you. If you have big structures are used to fix in one specific way, that is absolutely something which you use development. So you need to be open minded and you need to always look for possibilities. And these possibilities are there. That's one of the reasons why I also came and said my first opening remark, um, let's not have this as an isolated discussion. I think that everyone has said something which is 100% correct and we very quickly agree upon saying yes, that's the way to move on. What has also very clearly fundamentally changed is we do not talk local, we talk local business, we do not talk national business anymore, we talk global business, we talk communities, we have a lot of social networks out there. These social networks are why we not only tied to the net, they're tied to a lot of other activities. And we can play a completely different game here. Yes, the consumer is going up, he's asking a question. Questions which we didn't get earlier were when they had sent two hours, so I don't know what to answer them. That game has changed completely. If I do not answer, real time, I'm out of business. However, I do fundamentally disagree regarding the, the meaning of brands, because I do believe that brands, especially today, is getting a much bigger than what we've had in the past. For us as brand managers, however, the game has changed due to the fact that we need to follow up on these rules, and we need to know how exactly to play with our games, play with our brands, and say that actually they are also give a value added to our customers. That has, hasn't changed, it's the same question which has been asked for thousands of years. So, it is an exciting, it's a big, big opportunity for Um Now we have here the, the digital people, basically, DLDs, digital life design. So, in the second part, let, let us um, focus a little bit on the digital brands. And I was mentioning uh, David already. I'd like to um, ask Samir first. So, if, if that is all true and usage of internet is that big, Demographics, non demographics, so medium. Why? And, and obviously, look like look at the online advertising market in the United States, for example, it's 50% search, and that is basically Google. And the question is okay, if, if marketeers are, and there's local business in that too, right? Um, but if, if marketeers are spending that much on one channel with one company or a few of these companies, certainly um, there's an innovation. So and the question is, do you need all this brand marketing in the future? And, and do you need it in the internet, in this situation of the internet? And I'd like to understand from you now, how do you see that? And like first ask Samir, because he built his premise of plan that brands will come to the net. It's a fast growing company, 130 million users already, and uh, top, top eight, I think, in the States. But still, um, why do you think brands will come, and when do they come? Why they have to come so far? I think that's a really, really good question. And I think the only way to answer that question is to go back in history and look at what and how media changed and evolved. So if you look at the birth of television, there was no prime time when television started. Think about this. Right? This idea of prime time is relatively new. Right? That, when you see the progress of like that being created, it just takes time to figure out what consumers are doing when a new medium arrives, from going from one or two television ch channels to suddenly 12 change consumption, going to satellite with 100 channels, 1,000 changes it again, just how much we flip channels first. So the internet is, you know, I, I think we're, we're the right now culture, even if we're not that generation. You know, we know fundamentally that in the digital community that a lot of change has occurred in how we use the web. Of course it has. The problem is it's still a new market in terms of figuring out, as he said earlier, internet would be a communication medium in which you're doing email, uh, your profile, or in a chat, or it could be a consumption medium in which you're engaged, or it could be a two-way interactive medium. First thing I realized was that we were just getting to the point on the internet enough years had passed after the invention that it was no longer about the innovation of technology. That was a very important thing. So the equivalent would be, without the Betamax and the AV system for printing, you couldn't get the publishing revolution to occur. I believe that has happened. That was the first thing. The second thing was, 
if you regard the internet as a medium and you look at all the other publishing houses, the, the large publishers have always had separate print, movie, television divisions. And the reason they do is they understand fundamentally these are completely different businesses actually. That from the creative to the editorial to the packaging to the way the brands use that medium is actually for the same message. You know, a car advertiser could be doing an ad in the newspaper to drive you to buy a car while building in motion because you're launching something that will come next year, right? So the internet, I, don't, I think what Glam, the premise of Glam when I realized when I first heard it and why it appealed to me was very simple. It was that ultimately the internet will become a medium and when it does, brands will use it to engage and create emotion. And the answer to your question is very simple. If you look at total advertising, about 70% on an average is spent on the brand and emotional side. The direct response varies from brand to brand between 15 to 17 percent of, of the total spend. A lot of the great big CPD brands actually don't even do any direct response, right? So at some point, this starts to tip. I believe if you look at just the, what we've seen in this last downturn, at least in the U.S., the only part that grew, surge was down about 9% year over year. Performance based display was down between 50 and 50%. And the premium is beginning to grow. And the reason is, I think intuitively people now know that the consumers or the spenders, let's get more specific, are actually doing a lot on the web. We all are. So that's the, the consumer part. The second part, which was important, was just like television involved in paper, to create the right packages where brands could be could, could trust that they can actually engage consumers, we found on the web that had not happened. And a good example of that is if you open a magazine and you see a beautiful Louis Vuitton ad, and the next ad is actually hit the monkey ad, and the next ad is from a completely unknown brand. As a brand manager, the first and most important premise is brand proximity in the meeting. And the internet is actually a terrible thing for that. So what we what we realized was this was the time to be innovative and create the, the, the actual idea where you can separate out these things. And I believe that has happened. So to answer you know, your question of what will happen now, uh, right now, internet is about 8.5% of spending on, in the US. About 50% of that is search. About 26% or 25 is, is what I would consider direct response display and the rest is premium. Uh, these percentages are completely shifting. The internet will go just like it has in the UK from 8 to 10 to 15 to 20. I believe to about 25. It won't reach 30 or 33 that the US has in television. That's my feeling. And brand advertising will be more than 50% of that. That's it. The question is not if, it's when and how that will happen. So that's my answer. Okay, uh, thank you. That was <laughs> so basically you said, and we might quote your deal leads, 25% um, internet advertising, half of, of that will be brands. Um, that should be a multi-billion dollar business at this point. Um, and it should be soon there because there the, 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 you said the infrastructure, everything is here. So I'd like the others to comment on that. Do you agree? You don't agree? Um, what do they expect from the digital side, from all these digital entrepreneurs, what they have to do when you come to this medium, as Samia was just stating? Andrew and then David, <coughs> Trevor, and then I like might you as the challenge of all that again. <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> I would like to no. add on, on the no, I, I, I'd like to make two points. Um, First is I think we should, we're probably almost ready to stop talking about digital. And I think maybe the most exciting thing we could do next year is not have a DLD but just have an LD. LD? Yeah, because I think that digital is now so woven into the fabric of so many different things that we used to call media. Let's try and keep talking about it as, as if it's something different. It, it's just, it's not the way people live, it's not the way people are. Um, uh, you know, Times Square, uh, which used to be called Billboards, is a digital world. It's, it's, it's the most digital environment there is. And 
yet we don't talk about out of home and digital. We've got to stop doing that. Um, so uh, the second point is that connected to that, um, and I apologise if anybody was in Frankfurt on Monday last week because they'd have heard the story, but as you know myself, the, uh, I get all of my insight and counsel from my daughter, uh, who is now 18. And um, I was driving her back to school uh, last year. She was, you know, finally she was running the school website. And I was driving her back and I said, so what exciting things have you done to improve the website? Have you put a lot more information on it? And she said, no, no, it's already far too much information. So I said, well, what have we done to improve it? And she said, well, for example, um, she used to go on and then we put the timetable for today, having the classes or the practices or the quiet practices. But now, if you, Marcel, log on, what comes up is your schedule for today. Your classes, your basketball practice, your choir practice, whatever it is. And, uh, depending on where you log on from, an alarm goes off when you need to leave for the next class. So if you are having a free period, and your next class is English, and you log on in your dorm room, an alarm goes off four minutes before your class, because it takes four minutes to get there. But if you log on in the library, it goes off two minutes before two minutes closer to it. I said, wow, that, that's really clever. Uh, and then she said, and if you put in pizza, it will tell you what pizza's in the restaurant in the school that day, and the sections of the, of the pizza sections of the menus of all the restaurants in the area that deliver to the school come up with whatever they've got. And I said, this is, this is really clever. How did, you, how did you do all of this? And she said, if you need one sentence to live by, it was this, she said, you just have to figure out what's useful and the techies can do the rest. <laughs> and, and she is absolutely right. We have now reached the point where anything, but anything, is possible tech. That isn't the issue. The issue is finding what's useful. Rather than some news yet. Figure out what's useful and the techies can do the rest. I find that's, that's key to be quality, but just being here in the jam and uh, being here. So, some people say 25% is online advertising, is, uh, 12, basically, it's is, uh, is on brand. So, what do you think? Well, I, I, I find the segmentation is really hard to do. Okay. Because, what, what do we classify a, a, an extraordinary building in Times Square where yeah, you can text using your, you can text it and your image appears on the hook? Is that classified under that as, as digital I, 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 you say that, that well, I, just, I, honestly, I, I think nearly everything is going to have a digital component to it. So I think saying what percentage it is, is it's, it's a large chunk of 100%, not 25% on its own. And, and I, I really do believe that's the way we're going to think about it. We also don't distinguish, when we're talking about it, between uh, paid for media, earned media, and owned media. And all three categories exist, and all three categories are real, and all three categories can be important to differing degrees to the consumers of particular brands. I think, you know, I think we should probably stop worrying about misery and just concentrate on figuring out what's useful. Okay. Um, before I move on, Ms. I'd like to ask you from your market. So how do you see the digital um, advertising space evolving in Brazil? And is it different from the experience maybe in the United States, UK, or other markets? I think that digital is crucial. You're going to pretend you are, but you are not. But I can tell you that the biggest source of new business and revenue for our company has become uh, the digital level. Enormous growth. We launched an agency in California, and it was the agency of the year by advertising age. It's just one year old. And it's a wonderful <coughs> way to there's a problem in the digital world. The, uh, the old digital world is a great difficulty in building brands. It's marketing doesn't believe very much in digital, and digital doesn't believe very much in marketing. So that's a challenge. Because, for example, Google is not only an exceptional uh, service, but it's a fantastic brand. And now, as the government of China, as the PR of Google, because what the government of China is doing is making Google an even more important brand, because it's the challenging brand. You know,
know, Google now is 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 in the the, the, the challenging brand of the government of China, and that is going to go over over uh, Google a great importance. You know, everybody is writing about it. You know, uh, Google is appearing in another kind of upside. So if you see everybody who is has uh, had enormous success in internet. They were all also very, very keen in building it. I just to end, I just like to quote Steve Jobs. Don't listen to the consumer. <laughs> Please don't listen to the consumer. Because if Henry Ford asked what the consumers wanted, they would say a faster horse. So understand what the consumer wants. And don't fight against common sense, but surprise the consumer. Otherwise, you are going to say the same thing the politicians say. Because all of them read the same research. And the problem is that the consumer is like us. He lies. Okay? Are anyone, let's do a research. Anybody here is at Facebook? Can you please raise your hand? Unfaithful. Unfaithful? Everybody's faith. <laughs> Anybody here is racist? Everybody. Anybody here is sexist? Come on, guys. <laughs> so that's the search, you know? You ask the people. <laughs> Facts and theories, and what's the written facts and theories, we don't believe it, but 
to try to figure out something behind the screen because I think that's much more important and then to see how to drive our messages. And again, I do not also believe in what you said, and we do not talk so much about digital and this and that, we talk about complete communication landscape. And I do believe that's most important. I do believe that all kind of communication channels have their purpose. I do believe that content is king. I do believe that quality is going to survive in all areas. However, quality is something which obviously has got lost in certain areas. And a lot of people are so afraid currently of challenges and their own business. So they forget developing their business and they forget giving the products a real profile. And to make it very clear, me as a marketeer, where do I put my money? I do put my money on a platform where I have a capability to reach out to the people I want to reach out to. And that is something which unfortunately a lot of people forget. And then they get embarrassed that I do not put my marketing money on their platform anymore. That's just the simple stuff. Marcel, can you help some of you with this? Well, our, our, alone, basically. <laughs> no, no, our, our clients already spend 25% of the media in digital, and we have some that spend over half. So that's interesting. Some of that's because of our mix of agencies and a little bit of a US focus. I do think the reason we merged television and press together with it, really, was the whole thing is really confusing. On Saturday night, MTV ran a telethon for Haiti that millions of people watched it in high definition on PCs. If you went to CES, half the televisions were computers. If you listen to Michael Mendenhall today, there's 3.6 billion books burned without anyone reading them, magazines. I think we should get done with that. The King of Change books. I think, I think the majority of media will be digital. I think the challenge is you're competing with television now. you got to up your game. And I think at the end of the day, we've got the power to do all these great things we do in the PC screen and all screens now. It will be kind of, if we're good, it will be more brand driven. If we have innovative products, it will be brand driven. If we'll be promotional, we run out of ideas and we have to push commodity products. So I really pray it's majority digital and majority brand. Trevor. Uh, I, I would kind of just to what I just said before. You shouldn't ask the question that way. Because it isn't really about whether it's digital or not. Everything is digital. It's, it's permeating our life. And it feels like the question is the wrong question, which is to focus on the consumer's life and then we we'll solve from that perspective, which I think is what we said. The second thing I do want to kind of call to attention to, which is that I do love the idea of not, of not listening to the consumer to an extent, but I think we listen with our ears, we see with our eyes, right? We observe small things. Those are also pay attention to the consumer, and then we reimagine what's possible for them. And I think that there's some great brands doing some great things. So many people here probably use Genius from Apple, which is actually, as much as what Steve says, Genius listens to what you do, sees what you do, and provides you a great solution. So I, I, I think there's some really powerful ways in the, the digital world is giving us some better ways to serve the consumer. I think that's the part where I see tremendous opportunity for us in the future. So that's where I come from, which is, you know, pay attention to the consumer, serve them in some amazing ways. Reimagine what we know that they have their expectations. Um, I have this one comment, which is, I think what he said is absolutely right. And the reason both the question is important is, from a brand perspective and a message perspective, you have to look at the 360 of how you reach the consumer. The reason this question is important for this audience here is actually in the delivery platform as you had said, there's a lot of change occurring. So when we're talking about the numbers from a digital perspective, it's not to say it's, as you were saying, digital versus television or is IPTV digital or not, or when you're communicating and you know, just like we saw in the movie, the ad changes when you walk by, all this is going to happen. I think the reason is that the question is important is that if you look at the media business today, 50% of that is moving from a publisher perspective. So a large part of this audience completely relies on that number actually from a platform perspective, not from a message perspective. So I think if we separate the question out to say, from a messaging perspective, I don't know any CMO who does not listen to the consumer build from the heart and 
have a method that is tailored by platform. The, the economics of the spend on digital as a platform is a very, very important question because that is completely changing the power between publishing companies that you have to rely on at some level, even if, you know, even if you're using Facebook to reach the consumers, that's your platform. And the economics of Facebook versus Twitter are extremely critical right now to determine. So I think from, from that perspective, there really are two different questions in this one. So I just wanted to add, I'm just listening to what the panel had to say to that question. Thank you. We have another three minutes. I would like to ask, listen to the audience at some point, and have at least two questions from the audience. But Michael Trautmann, he created an own agency, and I will come to back to big and small. There's a mic over there. One comment, one question, challenging, and who, who would have the second question? Who wants to have the second question? Then you have, oh, after you, you identify, and then we close the camera. Question or just a comment. So I learned my lesson in my time at Audi, where I had to work with uh, several agencies all around the world. And we worked with BBDO in Brazil, with McGill in South Africa, with BBH in London. And the idea behind this was to work with the best agency in the country. Sometimes it was a small hot shop, sometimes it was a network. But I think it's not a question whether it's a big or a small network or independent yeah. agency. It's just a question oh, whether it's a good or a bad agency. I think it's that simple. Agreed. Second question. Do we have a third one? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite keen on... Um, Who are you? I'm Matthias from Meet Magazine. Um, and I'm quite keen on uh, getting some more insight into how a big corporation such as Mercedes and Nike actually have to face tremendous, I would say, internal changes on React. Like nowadays you say you have product is marketing, but of course this kind of um, uh, needs certain structures within your corporations, like how does R&D talk to marketing, you know, and all like this. I was just, just curious how do you deal with these uh, issues in large uh, global corporations. Okay. And now Dr. Borda. Wow. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Whatever you want your life, excuse me. The short name reply to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll reply as short as I can. I, I think what we have sort of tried to do is actually restructure our organizations so we can bring the functions together from product to marketing to the commercial to the R&D, bring those units together to serve a specific consumer audience. And with that, we start that creation. So rather than waiting at the end to sort of say, okay, what can we solve at the end? We think about it all the way from the beginning of the creation of that product how we actually bring it to marketplace. That's a structural change for our organization to bring, to bring those ideas to the marketplace. And I think really that one of the most important things is that we need to dare to dare. That means we need to take some chances. We also need to be the way to risk something. No one's going to really accept failures. There's a lot of things out there where you have no clue when you're really reaching out to And you need to do that. If you have a strong plan, you manage, because that is something which you will always survive. It's something you have to just test it and just do it. Just do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you, the power side. you need to cooperate, you need to work with other people with different kinds of competences. And of course, you need to have a lot of self-confidence, especially to convince your quite classically born, who are used to deal with nuts and bolts, that this is the way to approach. And that's challenging, but also fun part of it. So we have a lot of fun. One last question: Who in the audience is making more than fifty percent of the revenue in Gutenberg Media? Where are the streamer boys? <laughs> you. You make it eighty percent. Peter, you stand up. Peter, you stand up. One of us. The most profitable media company in Germany was built at the um, What I wanted to, to describe is that in the so called old media, Gutenberg media, every single picture, every single picture, the editor on the PC the transfer from the PC to the cylinder, there's only one analog moment. This is the moment where the cylinder full of color is hitting the paper. 
there's no much difference to unit packet. So what I want to point is that um, there is so much aesthetically to consider about the interface. The interface of paper is something totally other as the interface of a PC screen. And uh, the ever said Friday came up with a good description in which the down page or the book is more or less fixing the world for you. And you must concentrate. You are not going out of the So the world is in a kind of, in fact, one conclusion up the shows. But how do you translate up the shows? Huh? What happens? The web. <laughs> <laughs> the web is always going on and on. You are on the web, you are always outside. You, you, are, you are connected. But um, this possibility gives incredible impact. But in your brain, in your brain, I tell you, for brands, there is a center for stills. There's a center for stills, a center for silence. And you will see in the, in the next year, I was discussing about the influence of art with Obris, who comes later. I told him I cannot see anything what art can do in this new world. He said, yeah, silence, quietness. So, um, my believing is that the future of Brand and Gutenberg is that there's someone in our brain who is strongly reacting on still pictures, on pictures with the art, has not the same impact as the interface will probably do paper for the next 20 years. Thank you very much. There's nothing to add to this, just one word from Don Draper on advertising.